Al-Muhay minul azizul jabbarul mutakabbir. Subhanallahi amma yushrikun. Wallahu al-khaliqu al-bari'u al-musawwiru lahu al-asma'u al-husna. Yusabbihu lahu ma fi al-samawati wal-ard. وهو العزيز الحكيم صدق الله العزيم وہی ہے اللہ جس کے سوا کوئی معبود نہیں نہایت پاک سلامتی دینے والا امان بخشنے والا حفاظت فرمانے والا عزت والا عظمت والا تکبر والا اللہ کو پاکی ہے ان کے شرک سے وہی ہے اللہ بنانے والا پیدا کرنے والا ہر ایک کو صورت دینے والا اس کے ہیں سب اچھے نام اس کی پاکی بولتا ہے جو کچھ آسمانوں اور زمین میں ہے اور وہی عزت و حکمت والا ہے صدق اللہ علیہ وسلم اللہ علیہ وسلم اللہ علیہ وسلم Guest Dr. Ahmed Naz and Mrs. Farzana Akram for joining our session here. So, we'd I, uh, like to invite uh, Dr. Anastasia Khalia to start your presentation. Thank you for spending time for joining us. <laughs> Thank you very much for the polite uh, invitation. Uh, um, I need some instruction to share my screen. Uh, below, um, see uh, the participants and video and share screen option. If you uh, Just click on the share down uh, near the share screen, the share screen, doesn't it? This is oh, yeah, I open. cannot. Really Mr. Atif, can you help? Share screen. I just saw it. Okay. okay. Excellent. Oops. Sorry. But the screen. Okay. Yes. Now it's fine. Can it, Can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the kind invitation. It is uh, a great pleasure for me to speak to you today. Um, thank you, Dr. Zain, for, uh, for inviting me and for everybody for uh, giving up your, your time to participate. I know it's, it's late hour in Pakistan, and uh, that means a lot for me uh, for, for taking some time. I'm going to try to keep it short and emphasize on, on some key messages that I would like to communicate with you. So as uh, Dr. Zain said, uh, I am um, a program director for an MSc on obesity and clinical nutrition at UCL and a senior teaching fellow. Um, and, and I have a research component in my uh, role at UCL. My main uh, responsibilities are to align our teaching uh, quality with the one, uh, with the quality uh, assurance criteria that are set by Higher Education England. And um, so some, some learnings uh, from, from all this journey uh, through the years will be shared with you today. At UCL, um, we teach, we have a bachelor's program in nutrition and applied medical sciences. And we also run three uh, master's programs. And these are the ones that uh, are of specific interest to our applicants uh, to come at UCL because they share with them um, with the students, the research experience we have as a large global univer 
university with a lot of clinical settings. So they attract a lot of people that would like to stretch their um, training a little bit towards the, the more applied and the more clinical, but also research um, focused education. Uh, UCL is ranked um, uh, consistently among the world's top 10 universities. So we have a lot of um, a lot of processes in place to make sure that that quality of education is maintained. And we take pride of that research component of our programs. So what I'm gonna try to communicate today, I'm gonna try to discuss with you some different types of assessments we have in research-based education. And that will refer to both our bachelor's and our postgraduate programs. Uh, some evidence of good practice and scholarship. So yes, I will talk to you about uh, the theories or what, what would be nice to be done, but actually I'm gonna show you how we did some things. And I'm gonna attempt to engage you in a reflection exercise towards the end. Um, I will reflect myself through the presentation on the impact of this type of educational journey in the context of society. So why do we actually have to have this type of assessments? Why do we need to follow this criteria? So reflection, I usually say in my students uh, and peers, is an important part of what we do. We learn from listening to things. We learn a lot more if we experience these things from practicals, uh, but uh, we learn a lot more from reflecting on that experience. And to my surprise, I saw that as one of them, uh, one of the mottos on your university's um, um, a, a sign here. So I saw, I, I tried to, to find the translation of the three little Arabic words because I'm not uh, knowledgeable of the Arabic language. And I saw knowledge, contemplation, and reflection. And I think a big component of what education should be delivering is that reflection on the teaching and reflection on the experience. Because that's, that's when it becomes true knowledge. So the 21st century higher education um, is very, very different from what it used to be in the past, very different from the traditional type of education we were offering. There are a lot of political, social, economic, environmental upheavals. We recently experienced the impact of a pandemic which has shifted the approaches uh, in, in our whole society, our economies, the way we uh, we design our buildings and the way we teach, uh, the teaching environments as well. It has offered uh, all these changes in this century, new possibilities. We have technology that we use in education. Uh, more places, um, in more places, this is used more than others, but it is an additional tool uh, there. We don't, when I graduated, I used to go to the university library to gather my resources. And um, a few years later, uh, I had an online library and that was a revelation for me. So imagine these technological advances happening a lot more, a lot rapidly, a lot more, fa a lot faster lately. The impact um, of the digital type of education has allowed different opportunities uh, to universities that can engage. It allows a student to uh, attend a program that is far away from where they live. And it allows applications of that knowledge a little bit further than the classroom, what we call citizen science. And um, learning is a very different experience. So it's not just knowledge that is delivered by an established authority, such as a university professor or a university setup uh, and reproducing it, but it's, it's, it created very different meanings. Um, and I'll explore this a little bit more. Now, uh, can I please ask you to mute your microphones and then you can, uh, in the end, we will have a lot of opportunity to discuss things. Um, so good education in, in a scientific um, framing is all, is that, um, uh, that process of, um, of uh, engaging students in an active inquiry-based learning and Part of it is the interaction between students and staff, an integral part of it, but also the interaction, the, the peer interaction, the, the interaction between students uh, themselves and the interaction between staff, that peer collaboration, that's dialogue. And dialogue is a bi-directional process to get feedback and improve. 
So when we will discuss assessments, I always want you to keep in mind that one of the reasons we're doing assessments is to have access to that feedback from how this process took place. And I'm sharing some uh, scholarships, uh, some scholarship with you, some, some publications, books or, or papers um, through the presentation. So our challenge as, as UCL was how to create that connection between research and teaching, which for, for a, a good number of years has been separate. We had even the appointments in our universities and in many universities that have been uh, teaching at in the US or in, in my native country in Greece, re, people were having either a researcher appointment or a teaching appointment. Uh, and there were a few academic appointments that um, were doing both, but it was clear that um, uh, professor was were putting a lot more um, attention to one task or the other. And there was no um, flow between the two. So we're trying to see why the disconnect and how can we capitalize on that research capacity of a place to inform and improve our teaching. So I'll give you a little bit of context of what we're teaching through the courses and that will allow you to understand the examples that I give of some of some of our assessments. So we have designed our curriculum around uh, malnutrition and when we talk about malnutrition we talk about deficiencies or uh, excess intake of energy, protein and other nutrients and how do we measure it? What is the impact that has in clinical outcome? So um, we're trying to see uh, that imbalance and the problems it creates in the body. Some causes of malnutrition or undernutrition can be either starvation related or disease related. So a lot of what we teach is clinical conditions that lead to malnutrition. Now, a problem like this, when you address it through a curriculum and in our bachelors that, that goes for three years, um, explore different aspects of malnutrition. So we know that the, the, the impact of malnutrition over somebody's quality of life has a lot of, a big range of effects from weight loss to reducing dependence, which is aligned to malnutrition, but it is a bit different, uh, from increased risk of hospital admissions and how these are managed. We also uh, look at aspects of uh, who are the target populations for intervention. If you face a public problem um, outside the clinical setting, a public health problem such as malnutrition, where would you start your interventions uh, from? And we have a big problem of malnutrition in the UK. You would think that why would the UK have a problem like that? It's a developed country, it should be fine. It, it is not because one of the sites that we, we have a high risk of malnutrition is in the hospital. We know that um, malnourished adults are like 30% of hospital admissions. And um, so their path of the therapeutic path in the hospital will be effective, affected by that nutrition status. And we have problems uh, that are taking a lot of our um, public health budgets and a lot of um, um, of the healthcare budgets, such as uh, obesity. 63% of adults in England are overweight or obese. And uh, that problem is relevant both for men and women. And uh, that comes with um, a compromised um, quality of life for people living with obesity. Uh, and one of the things we need to address through, through our programs that we train healthcare professionals, we train dietitians, we train physicians, we tra train um, uh, other types of professionals in the healthcare system, we're trying to explain to them the causes of obesity and to appreciate that it's not individual responsibility. The evidence base uh, um, can prove that it, it is a, a very complex uh, disease that we need to appreciate. Um, genetics, for instance, have a big component of it. So the teachings have to be delivered through this. And it, it seems to affect um, children as well as adults in our country. And what I call in my lectures, the elephant in the room is the component of social deprivation. So yes, it is relevant for everybody, but in, in the social uh, classes that are uh, uh, socially deprived um, economically, the most deprived uh, parts of this country, the, the impact of that problem is a lot 
uh, bigger. And unless we address this uh, with, um, uh, with uh, policies that go hand in hand, we won't be able to resolve the problem. It's not, so the message through the curriculum, looking at different aspects of, of malnutrition is not like, uh, is, uh, is uh, the, 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 for, for the case of obesity, the eat less, exercise more is not gonna solve uh, such a complex problem. And of course, when we teach our students about approaches, we talk about the impact that um, proper addressing these problems properly, what kind of impact would that have for the society? So that affects emotional behavior of people. It affects the way they would attend schools or work, um, Ill, Ill health and uh, mortality rates. And of course, economics, the food environment, um, the NHS or national healthcare system are components of, of, um, of this problem that need to be addressed. So that's, that's my last slide to present that our teaching for something that seems to be pretty straightforward, intake of nutrients would affect your physiology and that leads to malnutrition. It, our curriculum looks something like the Foresight Tackling Obesity Report. It looks at that complicated picture of different components that participate to the problem and what, how would somebody address a complex problem like that. You can appreciate that for somebody that will be asked to have an evidence-based opinion and treat a patient um, um, based on this evidence base, they have to appreciate that complexity and uh, develop critical thinking. And that brings me to the challenges we face by designing assessments for the teachings that we offer in, this, uh, in, in that kind of programs. So some of the challenges are that we have modules with different type of content to deliver that um, knowledge. So we have specialized information but our clinical nutrition modules or our metabolism modules or um, the fundamentals of biochemistry are very different from the public health and policy modules or the epidemiology. So we're talking about specialized information that are running um, in little boxes through the curriculum. And we talk about a very diverse background of students. Uh, so we have students a large population of students that obviously, um, even if they come from the same um, city, country, they were brought up there, they come with a diverse, uh, with a, a diversity of skills and abilities. But adding to that complexity, we UCL accepts uh, students from all over the world. And uh, we, we do not, um, we cannot have very good processes on uh, understanding uh, their teachings or their preparation to reach a degree like that. So how would we design appropriate assessments for that diversity of students with diverse abilities? And in order to answer these, uh, we had to start with ba the basic questions. Why do we need the assessments? Uh, so I will pause there and ask you to unmute your microphones and I would like to hear the voices of two, three participants or what do we need assessments for in our programs, in our taught programs? Would anybody like to share? Uh, excuse uh, me, yes. I'm here and uh, I think uh, assessment is uh, desirable and uh, when we talk about assessment, uh, I would like to include formal and informal assessment. Absolutely. In order to know the students' progress. Absolutely. Uh, so that uh, uh, assessment, so, you know, it's quite uh, mandatory. Thank you. Thank okay, um, I will also want to contribute that assessment is actually uh, for, for uh, knowing the value uh, and worth of the performance of uh, our students or our subjects and that mm -hmm. we want to improve their performance and so that's why there are different types of assessments during the performance and after the performance. So actually Absolutely. assessment needs the improvement in the performance and to know the value and judgment. Uh, mm -hmm. about the Absolutely. performance of other subjects. Thank you very much. Thank you. So Excuse this me. is, uh, yes, Excuse go ahead. Me, one more point. Yes, assess, through, uh, it is only through assessment that the teacher as well as the students, they come to know about the weakness and strengths of their own. Mm -hmm. 
of their own. Thank you. Thank you for yes, both uh, teachers and both. students. Both. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm very grateful you mentioned it because I think this is something that we tend to forget as educators. And what we tend to forget um, is that Yes, they are a tool to provide some judgment of the learner's competency, so how well the students are doing, to understand how to help them in that learning journey. So if, if I have an assessment that everybody's doing really terribly, that tells me something about my teaching, not just about the, the way the students have responded uh, to that teaching, but also it ensures it's a it's a really nice tool to use for the growth and development of both the students and the educator. So through the assessments and how the students perform, I get feedback of what part of the teachings were not really clear or they were not very well highlighted uh, through the lectures and the program. Uh, and um, uh, I have a quote here from a really lovely book uh, that, um, that I read that we need to make experiences on assessments, and I'm highlighting the word, the word experience, as authentic, effective and efficient as possible. And the question is, how do we do it for the students, the teachers, the assessors? Because sometimes our dissertations are marked by people that are not teaching at the program and they're outside the university. External examiners is one of these assessors, for instance. Uh, and for the wider society, how does the wider society fit on, in all this picture? So some pedagogic, uh, pedagogical principles to keep in mind is that um, not everyone learns the same way. So obviously they, the students come with diverse abilities, diverse skill sets, but even in the same learning journey, they don't acquire knowledge the same way. Some students are better visual learners. Some students, um, they enjoy reflecting um, uh, better. Some, some students really need the practical component, the, the hands-on experiential learning to appreciate the uh, the knowledge and what is important is the journey we take the processes uh, as Angela Bruhai did here in that book on reading and teaching the processes of putting into practice these values and aspiration of an inclusive scholarly higher education community so the key word here is inclusive the, our assessment have to be inclusive in the sense that they have to appreciate they have to give the opportunity as a group of assessments they have to give the opportunity to these students with the different abilities to show their knowledge and understandings to demonstrate their critical thinking um, and so we cannot just have mcq exams through our courses we cannot just have essays or we cannot have just oral presentations because some students that are introverts uh, they don't enjoy participating in discussions and their knowledge and understanding cannot be evaluated based on this only. Um, here is an image of this book that on the center of that uh, research teaching and interaction of that um, uh, in a curriculum, in the center of that teaching and learning journey is that inclusive scholarly knowledge building communities. So that community generation between students and their interaction with staff and uh, an environment that allows them to express themselves in different ways is key uh, in uh, ensuring that success of the assessment portfolio that we will develop. So an example uh, um, of, of the things we're doing to ensure that inclusive um, assessment portfolio is to offer a variety of assessment types. So offer multiple choice exams, open book exams, because some people need a little bit more time to, um, to process and, and, and their critical thinking is very strong. In an, they may not be able to memorize information very well, but they have a deep understanding of that knowledge. And in an open book exam that they will have uh, the, the opportunity to develop that critical thinking, um, they will do very well. Uh, we can offer some, uh, we can have a data analysis or abstract exams. How do you summarize information from a paper and write an abstract that would be accepted uh, uh, for publication in a, in a conference? Uh, some students are really struggling with MCQ exams um, and they do very well in short answer question exams. 
Um, and I will go uh, in a minute about that variety of more innovative assessments. So some other pedagogical principles to keep in mind is that the assessments uh, need to follow some progression through the course. So there must be a continuity. Um, and the types of assessments need to link logically uh, with uh, that concept of testing a range of skills that I just mentioned earlier. And all of them lead in many programs to a final product, which is usually a final dissertation. It's a qualification exam if it's a professional degree. And this is where most of the skills are tested because there are little bits and pieces that will form that final big assessment. Um, towards their graduation. And for these, to ensure that our variety of assessments through a curriculum, through a program is appropriate, we have different tools. One of them in the UK is the TESTA exercise, uh, TESTA stands from transforming the experience of students through assessment. And all that is, is a checkbox of a few things that we need to make sure that we uh, conform with and we comply with in summative and as very well as somebody mentioned formative assessments as well and how they are interlinked to improve uh, the course design and delivery so test is a good practice that's a tool that we use and there are many different ways of doing it i'll give you the example that we use uh, every year or so and uh, depending on student feedback we do uh, do an audit on, uh, on our programs on student feedback and we're trying to see some consistency on uh, feedback we receive for the uh, whole curriculum. Uh, we consider student evaluations and we're trying to avoid over assessment because if we have a lot of assessments for students that interrupts their learning journey. It has assessments have to make sense and at the same time they offer a lot of burden for the teachers, for the educators as well. And uh, I'm sure that all of you as educators can appreciate that uh, you can uh, devote your time constructively in many other ways uh, relevant to the teaching. We're looking at students as, as partners. That's where we get our very useful feedback. We ask students for uh, monthly meetings to, to let us how they progress through the, through the course. And it an audit like TESTA is looks like this so through our exercise um, every one or two years depending on the program and the feedback we gather the team together we carry out um, a program audit somebody from the member staff is, is devoted to collect all the information and we map like i was previously at a meeting that we need to map our assessments for the next year and now that we're running our programs virtually that's extremely important to make sure that that variety in an online environment is maintained and that ability to test uh, different skill sets is maintained. Another principle to keep in mind is that the content of assessments needs to reflect the learning objectives of the modules. So for instance, I cannot teach a lecture on public health and um, uh, my learning objective uh, to, to focus on um, understanding the, the, the causes of public health problem, programs, sorry, problems and my assessment to be based on statistics. So I'll give you an example of that in a minute. At the same time, um, the assessment criteria that we use to evaluate these assessments have to have to test a variety of things. Um, knowledge and understanding, obviously, critical thinking as well if that's the kind of students we're trying to produce and at, in many assessments scientific writing quality in some other assessments presentation skills and that's usually a smaller component to give you an idea our knowledge and understanding for instance will maybe 50 percent of our assessment mark uh, for an, for an uh, assessment, critical thinking would be um, ranging from 30 to 40 percent, depending on the year. Um, so earlier on, it's a smaller component in, in our graduates. We expect them to have a better understanding of critical um, analysis. And the side, I think, writing or the presentation skills will be that 20, 10 percent of the presentation, again, depending on the assessment. An example of how do we align the learning outcomes to the assessment is uh, I put the learning outcomes of one of my modules here. That module is on nutrition and public health and my learning objectives or learning outcomes say 
um, that students are expected to, in the end of that module, to describe the main national and international data on diet and nutritional status in populations, to understand and synthesize the scientific basis and the recommendation from government policy, to interpret and draw conclusions from complex and conflicting scientific data, and to engage in a structured debate on policy issues. So if I have three things that I need to make sure the students understand when they finish this module and they develop as skills, my assessments have to be aligned to this. And I'm required in when I present my assessment plan to explain how each component of that um, assessment, summative or formative, is addressing these learning outcomes. So it will be an MCQ that has an MCQ exam, that module that tests whether they can explain some of that data and how they can understand this, the recommendations from government. But I also ask students to present posters. And in that kind of poster presentations, uh, we simulate that we're all participating in a scientific conference on nutrition. I actually invite colleagues from other departments to join in that presentation. And we pretend we have a proper scientific conference and faculty and, and, and other staff members are encouraged to ask questions. And there is a group of assessors that marks these posters um, going as somebody would go in a scientific conference and ask questions on a poster. Somebody mentioned uh, something very important earlier that there is a, a component in assessments that we call formative assessments. And these are the ones that do not contribute towards a mark, but they are there as an exercise to make the students, if you wish, confident about their assessments. They prepare the students uh, for, for one of the summative assessments and they're linked with the learning outcomes. So in this module, for instance, there is a debate discussion in class that prepares the students on their way of thinking around the poster presentation that they're asked to produce. Another principle that I want to highlight, and this is something that we were actively engaged, is uh, that of outward facing assessments. These are activities uh, around assessments uh, that mirror the kinds of communications such as public engagement activities that are undertaken by researchers and inquiring professionals in many fields. Now, how does this work? What does this mean? For example, when I had to set a new curriculum on obesity and clinical nutrition two years ago, uh, and I, I started thinking about assessments, I went to talk to people that hire or would hire graduates from a course like ours that would hire dietitians with subspecialty on obesity. And I was asking them, what is the skill set that you require your new hired people to be trained in? And they're really lacking that training. And I was trying to design assessments around that missing skill set. We want to offer the opportunity to our graduates to be comfortable and competent in a lot of things. And that ended up in, I, I, a few weeks ago, I gave a uh, reference for one of my students and the comment that I got from a non-profit uh, international organization was, we love getting students from your courses because they don't need additional training, because they know how to develop a business plan. Because even though it seems really unnatural to have something like that in a nutrition degree, perhaps, they know how to write an abstract for a conference, they know how to write a literature review, they know how to design a poster, they know how to stand in front of a big audience and have a, a presentation. And I have to highlight here because to all of you, my fellow educators, that the students complain about all that variety of assessments until the time that they graduate and they go to look for a job. And then they can understand that that's what makes them confident to, um, to compete. So some of the examples of these outward facing presentations are narrated slide presentations, something that has become really useful during the last few months that we're setting up online teaching. And I feel that this, our students that ended up uh, working in different universities or with different organizations, they are very comfortable to present that kind of presentations because we have been using them for the last 10 years. 
uh, to prepare web pages on a topic or blogs. We teach them how to do blogs because every, everybody uh, in community nutrition or an online expert that provides consultations has a blog. Uh, so they have to understand a proper way of doing it that uh, will ensure quality of information you're producing. Podcasts. It's, it's a new modern type of library. You have short podcasts on, um, on um, so many podcasts the last two, two months on the coronavirus uh, uh, pandemic and its impact on many different things. Uh, Wikipedia pages, short videos. Uh, my last assessment that I'm marking this week is a series. So the assessment was uh, produce a video presentation for a general practitioner um, setting. Um, so imagine that your patients will be sitting in a waiting room for uh, three to five minutes and talk to them about vitamin D in the UK and what is the supplementation policy by Public Health England. And getting them engaged with what kind of technology would they use, what kind of messages should they highlight in this three minutes or 90 seconds or whatever duration that is, and how do we assess it um, is, um, is a challenge. Individual or group presentations, because working with teams is what is happening in the real world. So even if somebody is a great presenter, chances are that they will be able to, they will be asked to pitch their idea in their work environment, working as part of a team. So we need to encourage that kind of assessment. Uh, we need to encourage students to learn how to work um, within groups. And that is rarely um, something that they enjoy once they, once they are first introduced to it. Because as, if, as it happens in every team, other members contribute more than others and they have to figure things out because that's, that's a real life scenario that happens in many teams. And they have to learn how to function in, given that reality of restrictions of working as a team member. Multimedia presentations, abstract exams. So we give them a paper uh, that the abstract is missing and we ask them to follow um, the instructions as per um, the usual format, the conferences, the IMRAD formula, the conferences accept to write an abstract. Uh, I have to tell you that since we started using that, um, our students got a lot better in writing abstract exams for their dissertations, for instance, because they uh, we had to um, that was something that they were living for the last minute, and they did we figured out they didn't know how to write the proper abstract. Uh, Poster display, displays, exhibitions. We we simulate the environment that we were asked from the Museum of Science to show up and present the food diet pyramid uh, for families. So pretend that you're gonna. Um, prepare a presentation like that. And mini documentaries. Uh, so one of the ones we had last year um, that was attended by the whole faculty was um, mini documentaries on uh, the built environment and health outcomes. Now, what are the challenges? It's great to have a variety of assessments. It makes it interesting to engage with them if you're a student. It makes it very challenging to market as an educator. And that's, I want, that's why for each one of them, we need to define appropriate assessment criteria. And we have a quality assurance team, which is the UCL Arena in our case, they're higher education uh, mentors that they ensure the validity and reliability of this assessment criteria. Uh, would a two minute present video presentation be appropriate for that kind of level of students or a 90 minute presentation is more appropriate? Excuse me, is an abstract exam, um, <laughs> of 90 minutes appropriate uh, and students need to be trained in these skills that are required so um, wrapping this up um, what is important in this assessment journey is to get effective feedback so the feedback that we will provide to the students that go through these assessments has to be focused specific to be provided on time. So we usually have the four weeks after the submission of the assessment that we respond to the students with a page of constructive feedback, mentioning three to four points to improve. And it has to be positive. 
So we're trying, we're not saying you did this bad, this bad, this bad, you can improve. We're trying to say the things that they approach correctly and how, how they approach uh, the assessment as a whole. And in order to ensure fairness of marking, we have a lot of um, uh, things we keep in mind. So we give detailed guidance to markers. We give clear assessment criteria. Um, every assessment is marked by at least two markers and they have to come in agreement. Um, uh, they cannot have a very big variation in their marking. And all marking is that done anonymously. I don't know who, uh, the student that I'm marking. Um, all of this is coded and only our administrators reveal that once the marking is finished. And we always explain to students how to use this feedback to improve on their next um, assessment. And I, uh, uh, my quote, my favorite quote on, on my lectures and this is that use feedback as a gift. Because as a student, I was feeling extremely vulnerable to receive negative feedback and a lot of criticism on an assessment I put a lot of effort to produce. And all I hear is just negative things that didn't go well. We have to highlight the good things, as I said, by also train the students that they have to um, accept this with dignity, with gracefully, and to take it and improve their next assessment. So we have designed um, a, our whole curriculum around these principles of interaction between learning and teaching as far as the assessments as con are concerned. And if you want to learn more about it, there is um, there's a, a UCL uh, website on the co connected curriculum for higher education and different activities uh, to allow these interactions. So I'll stop there and I, I'm with a request uh, for you to reflect with me. Um, I have to ask Dr. Zane with whether we have uh, a duration in the Zoom call or we need to reconnect. Can you hear me? Can you repeat what you just, you've just said? Uh, I said, we're, we're, do we have time in the Zoom call to discuss a little bit with the group? Uh, discuss how can assessment it determine? Be, it will, yes. It yes. Will be good. Yeah, yes. Good. Yeah. So the, the idea that I want to discuss with you is how do you think that assessment can determine the students' futures? Um, in your setup, in your university, in your country, with the challenges that you face, how do you think the way you assess your students can affect their path after graduation? What do you really mean? I can, could you repeat? Sorry, I'm constantly asking you to repeat your question. Are you, what is your question? What is that you want to know? So Whether, my question is, I would like to see your thoughts. How do you think, why do you think assessments are useful to affect the students' future after they graduate. Yes, of so our are. experience. Yes. We are uh, we are very. You can uh, definitely share your own experience, and we would appreciate that. But here uh, we think that assessment is at the core of uh, uh, good educational practices because it is about empowering the learners, taking Empower charge of their learning. And once you've done that, the, the framework which you've just shared is pretty similar to what we are doing here in Pakistan as well in this university. We give a lot of opportunity to our students to express themselves. Uh, that includes peer evaluation, self-assessment, and also instructor-led uh, assessment of what they're doing. But somewhere, somewhere along the line, I think we are stuck in some kind of a bubble. Um, and we need to sort of rethink exactly what assessment is all about. And it gives us uh, the uh, point of view. Um, and therefore, I cannot hear you. Sorry. I was, so I was speaking quite a lot, but then we got uh, this, uh, disconnected. Anyway, what I was trying to say was that it is very important. Assessment is somewhat neglected. We talk about, um, you know, learning objectives and things like that. And we do have some good indicators also. 
but somewhere along the line we are too much focused on tests here in our country you know set up examinations which yes. uh, is not a proper assessment in my opinion in my personal opinion my colleagues may this uh, disagree with me when it comes to higher education you need to give a lot of autonomy to the learner you can give them stimulus you can give them uh, your own ideas you can share those with them as the instructors and as teachers but you can't put them in in a in a very uh, restricting yeah. and they need to be and be emancipated you know emancipation of learner is extremely important. absolutely i couldn't agree with you more yep right so and i'm going to share yes please do so please I'm going to share um, an example of good practice since you talked about autonomy. I think it's critical for the learner's uh, growth and development. We had an assessment on students to create poster presentations that was very prescriptive. So we had a lot of guidance and that, this and that. And the students, they did well, but the, I didn't get that vibe of that they enjoyed the, the whole process. It was a group presentation. So the next year we said um we're gonna remove all this prescriptive content we will make it a bit more open so use common sense and basic like from the 10 points that they had to pay attention it was four points and don't pick one of the five topics we give you pick any topic that inspired you through your studies that is relevant to public health nutrition you cannot imagine you cannot imagine the evaluation comments in the end that that was the best experience through the curriculum because of that autonomy i suspect i cannot hear you uh, so um can i contribute something ma'am please the microphone ma'am uh, uh, yes please Asma, I will. Uh, Asma, you can please contribute. Thank you. Um, I, I'm uh, uh, Dr. Fifa actually. Uh, so I want to say that uh, the assessment process, if assessment process is positive, and uh, uh, it it's uh, positive for students, and we ask our students to do those operational things which they have to do afterwards after the completion of the course for example if they are working in groups and uh, they are uh, going for practical aspect of the course uh, that will be that is more suitable for their life in after their university uh, and because most of the time when they are in the community and they they have completed their education they are not going for the paper pencil test so if exactly we, yep. we try to practice in our classrooms that students should debate to share and to present mm -hmm. and to do something and even uh, think critically uh, towards each other's actions and each other's opinions but in collaborative form they work in groups so when they work in group they uh, they know how people can support them mm -hmm. and how they can you, support Dr. them Deepa, could you please unmute yes yes sure. exactly thank Dr. you very Deepa, much we can't hear you anymore please unmute I think it was a connection. Dr. Seba, I could, Dr. Seba, we can hear, hear you. Fine. Dr. Uzma, we can hear you. We lost her. No, she's still here. I think there was some connection error. Uh, we've lost Dr. Fifa. We can't hear her anymore. But well, uh, thank I you so muted, much for I your contribution. I have muted my, I have Asma, muted my mic, madam. Would you like to say something yes. about it? Yes. Now it's the turn of Dr. Asma. I have muted. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, it's a very tricky situation, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, are you able to hear me? Yes. Uh, okay, so, um, you know, um, over these years, I've come to realize that uh, marks and grades are not synonymous with learning. Learning sure. is, a is a totally different area and exams are a totally different area. Mm -hmm. And uh, I found formative assessments to be far more useful. And mm -hmm. for that, I think ideally the class strength needs to be minimal so that you are able to give more frequent uh, feedback to the students. Because mm -hmm. it's the feedback that really makes the difference. Sometimes we don't get time to even, you know, properly read through their assignment, forget about, you know, adding feedback and uh, giving it back to the students to improve on. And mm -hmm. it's something like, you know, uh, I'm a language teacher. 
like you have a process approach in writing i think that our assignments need to be more critically evaluated and they need to be done over a process of time so that the students get deep into it uh, to understand what is expected from them and they you know make their own revisions and they realize their own mistakes that is when that lifelong learning kind of thing is really going to translate into their learning so we really need to reevaluate uh, our grading and exam system and the weightage that we give there and uh, you know make it more and i really found your idea very engaging that we put them into practical aspects where they are going to be which they are going to face once they are you know in in real life situations when they are in a job situation because these are the, this is a skill set that they totally lack they've mm -hmm. only uh, crammed up material which they don't understand and they regurgitate it and they get a fantastic grade but when you ask them about what the subject entails they have absolutely no clue yes 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 absolutely engaging past graduate is something that was very useful for us so people that graduated 5 10 years ago they usually we invite them some of them that are engaged in academic academic activities we invite them to come and give lectures but not only that to come and join our these uh, course or curriculum or assessment evaluation exercises because they have an idea of how the course was and evolved and they can highlight some things that they came across through their professional um, uh, life after graduation and say, well, I wish I knew how to write a business case, for instance, yeah. or develop so a, a business plan value. for public health. Yeah. yeah. Or Absolutely. something that we designed the last three years is how to write uh, a systematic review following a Cochrane protocol, which, and suddenly the last two years, I have three students that were hired uh, by Cochrane collaboration to work in policy relevant to because they got through this training and they understand um the language of nutrition guidance and the cochrane protocols now so right. th thank you for, thank you for your uh, ideas um i think um education is a lot more than um uh, that uh, theoretical knowledge that we provide or the practical skills they have it has to be linked all that experience has to be linked uh, with what are we trying to change in society? Are we trying to produce critical thinkers? Maybe that's what we need to do and that has to be one of our priorities for our students at a time that there's so much fake information, there's so much Facebook expertise on everything. I see it on, on my uh, field, a lot of uh, celebrities that seem to have a PhD in nutrition, but they don't and people follow them. So maybe we should train people of how, what is evidence-based um, uh, medicine? What is evidence-based practice? Uh, what, that, what is the quality of information we should uh, produce? Uh, how, sh how should they read the papers that they're uh, reading? Um, what is the value of a study that has uh, 10 participants versus a, a GWAS association uh, study? So in summary, and, and I would love to, to continue the discussion, um, I hope you can appreciate that um, assessment of students learning is a high stakes activity. And when I say assessment, thank you for highlighting, I mean the combination of summative and formative assessment. It is a time consuming process for students and assessors, so we cannot look at it lightly. Um, it is linked to the experience the students have uh through the course uh, it, it's linked to to that learning journey so we have to make sure we do it properly the assessment design can shape the ways in which students uh orientate themselves to their studies uh, and um, I, re I certainly remember myself being engaged with um, uh, public health um, nutrition and epidemiology because the challenges through that module gave me that autonomy um that was highlighted earlier to develop my thoughts around this and do deeper deeper reading on that area and my path went through this direction feedback assessors affect progress uh, attainment but also self-confidence and self-concept and one of the first things if i have a new uh, team of markers or assessors to to help me marking my assessments in was we have cl classes of 100 students so we need the manpower the first thing that i'm saying to um to people is that we don't mark as if it's um 
a, a grant submission. We, we don't do that ruthless pointing out all the, all the um, errors then. It's, we, we need to provide positive and constructive feedback because the student has paid a lot of effort to produce something. And if all the feedback is negative, that's not gonna allow them to keep reading after the second line. So they have to be, to feel that they have done something right and they can improve of these things. They have to be quantifiable. They have to be specific and measurable. The assessment can determine the student's futures. Uh, and I think through the reflection exercise, all of you can appreciate it. And it can have an impact on opportunities for further study. I agree with you that mark and grade is different from the exp assessment experience or the learning outcome skills. We need to find a way to align. And I think that the challenge is different for every degree and program all of us design. So practical modules with a lot of practical experience are a bit different in the challenges than more theoretical ones. Um, thank you very much for listening. Uh, I, I, I welcome any discussion, uh, anything you would like to expand on. Um, and please uh, share your experience through, through your um, courses as well. I would love to get more ideas to, to improve our practice as well much for your comprehensive talk we have learned a lot especially in this era we are designing an online system and also for assessment so uh, we learned many new things like we uh, know now that we have to engage student for uh, designing the web pages blogs wikis and podcasts and uh, different types of uh, presentations so that they will uh, grab more about their subject so house is open for discussion. If anyone wants to question something or uh, ask something, because um, I hope so that it will be very effective in future for designing the course and curriculum and assessment thing. So, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Uh, sorry. Uh, yes, yes, ma'am, you please say something. Uh, I can ask my question later. Yes, trying. I was just trying to fill in. Please uh, fill in. Ask anybody. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Anastasia. It was really thoughtful um, session and I have learned a lot from your session. And uh, as Dr. Uzma Qureshi has mentioned that uh, we are using all these assessment methods in our, uh, in our country, uh, which you have mentioned, and some of them are new, I admit that. But do you think that is there any change in your assessment policy uh, due to this corona pandemic? Like students are sitting at their home, students are working from their home, and uh, there is uh, there is some uh, they are learning new things. Uh, like faculty is learning new things. Do you uh, can you please suggest something in the light of your knowledge that what could be something uh, really working in these days for the assessment on part of students on part of the faculty? I shall be mm -hmm. highly obliged if you could just suggest something and can guide us uh, as we are designing. And uh, Dr. Mariam has mentioned oh. that we are designing Does something new for the sure. students. So thank you for the thank you for the question. Um, I think the whole learning environment has been impacted by the recent pandemic. I cannot count possibly the amount of hours I have devoted on training with different types of teams at UCL since um, February, before a month even before we closed down on alternative ways of not only of delivering education, but on assessing uh, the, the learnings. And I think what we have done is a lot easier than what we are requested all of us to do in the future. So one of the, um, so perhaps I can share with you some of the um, key ideas that we're trying we're still trying to find the proper solution for we're revising the solution and the plan we have as we speak because we we are faced with new problems and i think it will be a while until we have the best um uh portfolio of assessments if you wish and that will be really personalized on the type of degree that somebody's running on the type of teaching teaching teachings they're delivering so something that we have to, that we face, uh, despite the fact that we live in an era of technology, you, um, we, we rely um, um, on somebody having their personal um, uh, technology to attend the teachings, which is discriminating people that do not have access to that. So one of the 
going back to that inclusivity, you cannot assume that everybody has a study space at their house. They may live in a house of too many people with poor internet connection, um, that they don't have a library to go to and study. Or I had a student uh, in a different university that was telling me that she had to put her three kids to sleep before she actually engages with the teaching material in her assessments. So that kind of setup, if that's going to be our new norm, is going to be a bit challenging for, for a group of people. And we have to be as open-minded and supportive as possible. Um, but uh, let's say that this is a given that everybody has access to technology. Uh, we're teaching, in our case, people in different time zones. So that makes it very difficult for us to decide between synchronous and asynchronous teaching. Because at the moment, I'm running a class and I have a student in California and a student in China. That means that I have to plan my hours of teaching around 2 p.m. UK time to 5 p.m. max. And uh, some my um, US students are going to wake up at seven in the morning. My Chinese students are going to work very late at night if we have an online gathering. I cannot possibly run six, seven, eight hours of teaching a day on that kind of restriction. So we have we need to provide teachings that are asynchronous and meet for that um, um, for that live interaction to ask the questions. I haven't forgotten you asked me about assessments. The reason I'm mentioning is, is this is because that learning, that accomplishing these learning objectives that will be met by our, by your assessments will be affected by that kind of delivery of the content. So we have to make sure that there, the, the students have kept, have participated in that opportunity, in, in that knowledge we provide to them. And they have engaged in the learning interaction and learning uh, the live learning interaction in order to be able to compete uh, properly in these assessments and equally. The only way that we found around it is to have small bubbles, so small groups of students that will um, uh, will interact in different times during a day, which makes the educator's role very uh, intensive. So for a class of 100, for instance, that I have at the moment, I have to meet with groups of 10 and discuss the content of the same lecture that will be available for them online to make sure that they understood the content to participate in a debate if that's going to be their assessment. We do not um, encourage um, um, uh, online MCQ exams, for instance. The reason being that um, uh, we tried very different um, formats, um, different uh, um, um, software to ensure that uh, there is a time restriction, um, the exam is available for 24 hours, and then once you log in to take the online exam, you have 60 minutes to respond to these questions. We changed the questions to be uh, problem solving, case study responses, so that somebody cannot cheat by having their phone next to it or, a, or an open book. But there is certain thresholds in everybody's imagination on how to assess certain things with a certain number of questions. Um, and internet connectivity is a real obstacle in something like this. I had the challenges of students taking live videos of their themselves taking an assessment, showing to me that they were clicking on option A for an answer, but they couldn't go to the next question. And that was an internet connectivity story. So how would you go around things like these? Um, so at the moment, our plan is to, um, to keep that variety in assessments. Uh, we, we do have a lot of um, presentations with a narrative on the back, a lot of live questions to the students after they present the presentation. Uh, we do keep um, the assessments that are friendlier with technology, so such as how to produce a video presentation or a poster and send it to us as a PDF and then stand there in a virtual conference room to, to accept questions. Uh, what is going to be difficult to accomplish, I suspect, is the group assessments. Um, make sure that the students gather together in a virtual environment to, to work together towards an assessment. And it will be a real challenge to, um, if, if it's a 
a live presentation and a live assessment, it will be really challenging to engage the introverts uh, to answer the question um, as fast as the extroverts and be, be, be not be discriminated from, for that um, um, unwillingness to, to jump in first in answering. Um, I guess the short answer to your question is that we're, we're learning as we go. And part of that resilient educational leadership is to be able to, um, to, to have um, frequent evaluations of, uh, of, of and, and revision of our plan. And that will take a while to evolve. Um, Thank you. Uh, there is one question from uh, participant. She said that she want to ask what are the criteria to mark such a assessment technique? Sure. So it, it, I, I, there's no one, one set of marking criteria, let's say for a um, um, video presentation or a poster presentation. But, uh, and the reason, the reason is because it depends on whether that belongs to an undergrad curriculum, to the postgraduate curriculum and what is, um, the background skill set that the students have been building. But just to give you an assess, uh, an example, we can talk about assessment criteria for assessments for for hours. Uh, I, I recently, recently, six years ago, attended a, a class that was running for two terms on assess how to devise assessment criteria. Uh, but um, I have to say that they have to um, they have to mark the three components that I mentioned to you. So some component would be the presentation, whether that's scientific writing, language, um, formatting or presentation skills, if it's an oral presentation. Um, and that's a small component usually in the marking rubric, but knowledge and understanding would be the ones that will take most of the mark and critical thinking is another, another thing. Now, everybody translates differently the critical thinking component, as you can appreciate. And when I'm talking about critical thinking, I'm talking about the ability of the student to look at the evidence and, um, and uh, show understanding on, on linking it to uh, the findings they, found, that they are observing in their data presentation in their studies. So how do they translate the scientific literature and have wide reading and how they, they use data from other studies to um, compare their findings? Uh, or how they they summarize the evidence available uh, in research in the research they present. Um, so so all these are um, are components of the marking rubric. Now, if it's a group presentation, um, there is, for instance, if there's a poster, poster presentation, fifty percent of a of the poster mark will go to the actual presentation of the poster. So is it, can somebody read it? Uh, does it follow the guidance? Uh, so that some component of it goes there. Can they, are they able to follow the guidance on how they should write something? And all of you can appreciate that when you submit to a scientific journal or to a conference or a grant, that will be rejected if you haven't read the guidance properly. Uh, they will be sent, if they're kind, they will send it back to you before rejections to say, please change it. Otherwise they're just gonna reject it. So they have to be able to do that. And after this, um, at the group presentation mark, we're talking, we're trying to identify components of group work. So we're trying to see um, how well the sections are linked together. And then we ask them questions. And there is, we ask two questions per individual that is presenting the poster. And depending on their answers and the quality of arguments they, they develop, we give them a component of individual mark in that group presentation marking. Um, so for, the, for an abstract exam, for instance, it will be, um, we need, something I need to highlight is that the students are aware of the assessment criteria and what goes in each component of their assessment at the beginning of the module. So they know that if they don't develop their introduction or if they don't follow the Imran formula for the abstract, they're gonna lose 10% or 20% of the points. So that tra uh, transparency helps a little bit in their performance, a lot in their performance. They know what to expect. 
Now for something like a video presentation or blog presentation, again, that depends on the guidance they receive. So for the video presentation, we ask them to provide an abstract and um, uh, 10 references that they base their public health nutrition video on. Uh, we say that the language has to be appropriate for an audience that sits in a GP practice. Um, we say that the speed, uh, we cannot evaluate the quality of the technology. They're not software engineers, they're not journalists. We cannot put this in our marketing rubric, but we evaluate, going back to the learning objectives, the quality of science produced. So if they have to present a uh, video on vitamin D and, U, uh, and the UK guidance, they have to provide the right information about it. They have to address the things we, they were taught in class and not forget that for children, we have different guidance or winter months, the guidance is different from, from summer months. So things like this. So ma'am, please conclude uh, the session. I request you to conclude the session, ma'am, please. Right, thank you very much, um, Anastasia. It was really very enlightening and we really benefited from your presentation today. And we hope to see more of you in future. I'm sure that you will have a very close liaison with uh, Dr. Zan to uh, take it further. We are going to have a virtual conference soon and in that we would like to have one of your sessions so that our students and faculty get another opportunity to speak to you and learn from your experience. Indeed, assessment has a great role to play in the future of the students who are studying with us now. And there was a question about uh, addressing social and emotional part of learning in this COVID scenario where we are sitting in isolation most of the time. And we are not very sure about the future of the world, let alone our own personal future. So I think with, uh, with a collaboration such as this one, we can at least connect as you at a human level and um, go through this experience together and come out of it learning to be a better world, inshallah. I hope so. Thank you very much. With, uh, with a huge thanks to you and Dr. Zen for conducting this very good uh, session. I thank all of the participants also who spared their time to be here with us. And we hope that they continue such a support to this university and to such ventures by us. Thank you again. We beg leave. Thank you. Thank you very much.